and the, I put the pink stickers for some key formulae. And they're agreed formulae, they're widely agreed. This one is on the comparative method with Boolean algebra, so that takes it further in the uh, Boolean algebraic direction. So you can just circulate those. The region that I'm going to be speaking about today is Bangladesh. And we have other papers today related to the same project, <laughs> which are about North India. So I do have a map here that shows the relationship geographically between Bangladesh and northern India, especially north central India. Northeastern India is much further north near China and, and, and Bhutan. And so um, here we see Bangladesh, a long slim country. And our villages for, that, for the data I'm using today are in the far north and far south of this country. And then we have in the country of India, the state of um, Uttar Pradesh is way over here. Gorakhpur and Varanasi are visible at the left-hand side of this map. So I'm just going to circulate that so that you can see where these different places are, uh, lying in one big region in, in South Asia. So I begin the talk proper then. Um, I have to thank John McLaughlin, who's been doing programming in Python, which is a language somehow yeah. similar to C++ yeah. or something. And um, we have funding from British Academy, thank you to them. The British Academy wanted us to follow an argument through different methods, and we had written that we would do that in regard to labor. So the labor that I'm going to talk about today is both domestic work and, if you like, the other paid or potentially paid economic work. I don't like to separate the domestic work from the other economic work, because it's all in the economy. And our project is going to help to clarify that terminological issue. And that's the address of our Facebook site, and Compass and JiskMail have some of the other experts all liaising carefully. And today, I'm going to try to push the methods forward in the use of QCA. So this uh, point number two in the presentation is a very typical method shown in these books that I've issued. Uh, but there hasn't been a working goodness of fit test yet. So I'm going to introduce an F test, which someone else wrote about, which I'll cite very carefully. But they, they didn't implement it correctly, and it was in 2009, it wasn't used. And now we've made it ready to use in GitHub. So if you download our package from GitHub, um, you'll be able to see the results for your own data set or for our sample data set. And I'll show you some sample results from Bangladesh today. So that'll be in the empirical findings. In GitHub, there's a PowerPoint with appendices which show examples of data sets. Here's an, a sample, for example, just showing in Excel that we're typically working from a spreadsheet of cases. In this particular case, it's women who are married or uh, female-headed households. So each row is one woman. And we have the assets of her household, her education, her household size, land holdings. And here is a 0-1 crisp set, or in other words, binary variable, whether she's a female-headed household head or not. So if she's married, she's not a female-headed household head, because in the traditions of that area, it would be the man, it would be the household head. So there's a female, 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 and here female. We've got um, 450 people in this. Um, we can look at the data later. And then these are the variables which we might consider as possible outcomes of the model. I really am only interested in one of them. But if you can put your data in such a format with six Xs and one or two or three or four Y variables, then you can shove it into our program and it'll give you the results, which I'm going to show you. So the results, um, i show you a little later. They really develop QCA in a, in a new way. And it'll then be possible to make inferences using hypothesis testing with weights on the data. So if you had a random sample, you would be able to apply the weights corresponding to the design of that sampling. And at the moment, we can't do that. So it's, it's not looked on very favorably by statisticians. So I'll just explain what QCA is and then move on to the new part. So QCA includes fuzzy set comparative analysis. And for those cases that are in the rows, it, it gives a way of studying any systematic causality that might emerge from the group. Um, we make a simple data table. You saw the binary variable. You can have ordinal variables or continuous. And then you can discern patterns that appear to be an X being necessary for Y. We may call it necessary causality or an X being sufficient for Y. And it turns out those are converses of each other. And to some extent, if an X is sufficient for Y, then we may not wish to say that it's necessary. If it's necessary, then it's also part of every sufficient um, combination that led to the Y. So being necessary for Y, all the Ys have it. 
And so we sort of drop out the necessary causes, having analyzed them. So there's a kind of protocol for this QCA. There are already five or six textbooks on how to do it, perhaps more. Um, and some of them have errors. So the book I've circulated with R has some, a couple of unfortunate equational errors. But the R program is fine. It's just that they didn't proofread the book well enough. So this can be used on any sample size or a whole population. And I don't think you're familiar with this. I'm just going to stress that it's conjunctural. So what this means, conjun conjunctural logic means you could have a conjuncture of conditions, like I'm in the scheduled caste group, it's a low, low status group in India, and I have low assets and I have maybe high education. That would be one conjuncture of structural conditions. And then I make my decisions about work. And the argument in this literature is they work together. You know, the outcomes are contingent about whether the lady is just doing housework or whether she's doing farming work. It's contingent on various things, but the structure is a really important part of that contingency. And we should look at every possible structural combination, but many do not appear. So Reagan has made his career, he's very famous, for pointing out that all the possible structural permutations do not appear. They don't appear because uh, the way economies work, certainly in capitalism, you just don't get very many people with degrees who are having no land and in this scheduled caste group and come from a back village. Um, there are not very many of them, sometimes none, you know. So that's called limited diversity. And this method is meant for really looking at the structural uh, basis for outcomes, which may be mediated by all kinds of other stuff. So in sociological terms, habitus, institutions, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, it's partly the structural that we want to really focus on or that we can focus on. And I have found, through doing about 10 of these QCA studies, that if you're looking at agency, let's say I don't know, choice of where you go to school or choice of how much education, then it may not um, give any results because the agency is all over the place. People make choices with various rationales for those choices, and they're quite creative. But if something is structural, like how much assets you have, then you get a strong result. So we'll see whether we can work with these truth tables. That's the simplified summary of the data. Can you see in the truth table here, there's the number of cases in one column. So it's one, four, one, two, three. That's a summary of some other data, and it's a more concise summary. So it's even handy just to do this kind of analysis to show your data to people and to see the patterns in the data, even if you still do your statistics and regression and you, know, you don't limit your work to this method only. Uh, so the traditional measure in, in QCA is called consistency, or CSUF, I'll write it. Um, but they don't deal very much with the question of random sampling. So they get a measure of the consistency of the data with the hypothesis, say, that X is sufficient for Y, but they haven't really dealt with the fact that there might be bias in the sampling if it wasn't a random sample. Or, in fact, what often happens is it's not a random sample at all. It's the whole population of, I don't know, it could be the countries of Europe. And then where did they put the boundary on the eastern edge of Europe? It's perhaps arbitrary. And with that arbitrariness, you affect your results. So again, the, the method has been criticized for a kind of bias. So what we'd like is to have the method ready to use on random national samples of microdata that are, you know, have all this sophistication that we usually expect for statistics. So let's say we do, suppose we do. <laughs> I mean, there's a big debate going on. Two journals came out last year with round tables discussing this controversy of whether it's even valid. And in sociological methodology, I argued it is valid. And two other reviewers published papers saying it is valid, but the lead paper was saying it's not a valid method. But they misunderstood the method completely. It's just ridiculous. So it, partly because of the different algebra that's being used. So look at my symbol here. An X, what I've referred to as an X, could be a combination of those you know, mutually coexisting structural background factors, even the region even the language of that family. So we use intersection symbol to mean x1 intersects with x2 intersects with x3, and we call that the vector x in bold. Having said that, we can now test whether this vector is sufficient for y, or is it instead x1, x2, x4, or is it x2, x3, or is in fact one of those sufficient on its own? That's the test we want to run. So we, I, I run it in a spreadsheet, and I have some results I can show you. So that was the data, if you recall. And this is what my results are going to look like. So you're just seeing color at the moment. These are rows where there is signs of sufficiency of that configuration for y. And the columns are just the results. So there's an f column that I've highlighted. And I'm going to explain that f test. But I look closely at the left-hand side, and I see 1, 2, and 5. 
and also one and five. So these are these are one and five is embedded inside one, two, and five. Some cases have one, two, and five. Those without two have one and five, but not one, two, five. So they are nested. And that's the really interesting thing about the findings. After you do this math, you can do a Boolean reduction and simplify the results, which I'm not going to go into very much today. <laughs> I just want to offer an alternative to the consistency measure CSUF. But our software cr uh, creates a CSUF column, so we see the consistency level. And then it has the F column and the P value for that F. So that's the formula for consistency. It's the sum of x intersect y. So we do a fuzzy set intersection of, or in other words, to what extent did they both occur, x and y, uh, divided by the sum of the x values. So it, it turns out it's really simple. It's conceptually very simple. But the authors in sociological methodology, Lucas and Satrowski, they have totally misunderstood the method. They thought it was about statistical error. <coughs> this is very disappointing. And the reviewers should have blocked it. I rejected the paper. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, but if the editors think that the debate is worthwhile having, there must have been some good points in their paper, uh, particularly about random sampling, then we have to have the you know, acceptance arguments and the rebuttal arguments. And it goes on. Now it's in the political science journal. And 48 papers were published this year in the Journal of Business Research, which were all applications of QCA, taking it as a given that it was an acceptable method with fuzzy sets. Um, so, you know, now there's a shortage of reviewers in this area. So to review, you just have to understand the consistency formula. You're probably mixed up at this point. So what it really means is we're testing to what extent the variables, if plotted in the x, y space, to what extent is, are they consistent with the idea that they're all in the upper left triangle. Because if they were all up here, then when x becomes higher, say greater than half, then the y would be greater than half or greater. Do you see what I mean? This is where x equals y, and this is where y is higher than x. So we call it the sufficiency triangle. And that's the main one I'm going to focus on here. So point A would be consistent with sufficiency. Point B is not consistent. And we're going to say that there's a distance or an error in relation to point B and C here, because they're not in that triangle. And D has no error. D is consistent. But it doesn't give much information. It's when some points have some x, that we can test whether x affected or was at least associated with them having y. So we move out of the Euclidean space into fuzzy set space in order to get the data into this box. And it's really a handy transformation. It's very innocuous. It's a monotonic transformation, which we explain in the GitHub um, background. Here's uh, some evidence from Germany, which I was keen to mention in relation to social mobility. These are regions of Ger Germany plotted on the fuzzy set space 0 to 1. And a few regions are exceptions. But HB and all these other regions are consistent with saying that low availability of early childhood education is sufficient for a high level of social inequality in that region. So it's assuming that the education system structurally affects the social mobility outcome and that it's been working for a while so that the effect has you know, kind of permeated these, the whole regions of Germany, including East Germany. Um, but then there are these exceptions. But it's a pretty strong result, and it meets the usual criterion for consistency, which is that they would all lie within that, or uh, least consistency would be 0.8. And in the current manual, it says 0.75. And one of the criticisms is, how did you get that cutoff? Why 0.8? Why 0.75? That no rationale really has been given. So um, Reagan tried to give one in 2000 with the p-value based on his Ed statistic, but it wasn't very convincing. It didn't convince very many of us at all, and I never used it. But we think we've got a better solution. Um, so that's how the German regions data looks in our software. We've run the, this classic example through our software. And you get sort of 50 graphs like that. And this one shows that once it's been squeezed into our, this is now a z-score space, minus 3 to plus 3, and minus 3 to plus 3 for the y, for the outcome. So the ones with high social inequality had, well, also, not quite high, the varying levels of the, in, of the input, right? Um, so you can ask yourself whether that's a convincing pattern or not, but I can show you that there's a lot of other patterns, and it picks out the ones that are of that kind. And so that's quite a useful thing, and we will enable you to do that visually with your eyes, just looking at, say, 40 of those diagrams. And then you get the results as an addendum. So I turn now to DSOF, which is the distance measure of the same thing. So the way that um, some authors have suggested we do it is we consider that Y might have measurement error, 
And it's a frequentist discourse that we're using. Because instead of softening the actual criterion, what we could do is soften our assumptions about how accurately these have been measured. So we could say, well, suppose each of those was kind of in a round. I've got a picture to illustrate this. So kind of, you know, let's allow some softness in this boundary. Or let's allow that the data themselves might have been wrongly measured. And if they were wrongly measured, then some of them kind of might, the true value might lie somewhere else near to where the current value is. And if, if you've ever done um, programming, you might realize, well, we could bootstrap that. We could model that. And we're moving toward a bootstrap result. It turns out we don't need that because we can just do it with the methods suggested by Eliasson and Stryker. Now, Eliasson and Stryker published a paper in Sociological Methods Research in 2009. And they said, let's work out this D value. They said, well, D will be 0 or 1. So it's going to be a value which, if the data are in the upper triangle, then it'll allow no distance to be added to the distance measure. But if the data are in the lower right triangle, we'll add distance for each point and then sum up those squared distances. So it's a very simple concept. Um, and their paper was accepted. It was a really confusing paper. So we just take our data, which is in the 0, 1 fuzzy set box. We transform it into a fuzzy, uh, sorry. We transform it into a box which is in normal measurement space. And it's actually two Z scores. So we've made a Z score from the F Sorry, from the fuzzy set score. And it's for funny reasons, and it is a bit time consuming because you have to, say, if you have age, you'd have to first make it fuzzy and then transform it this way. So that part we haven't um, made easy for you. No, no, the first part we haven't done, we haven't calibrated it for you. But if you give us the calibrated data, then our package produces these other scores. And you can see the pattern is exactly the same, it's just the scaling that's changed to make it fit with what Eliasson and Stryker said we should do. So you've converted them basically into normal distribution scores. You haven't made much assumptions in doing that. Those assumptions aren't going to be relevant to the, uh, the F statistic that results. And then you measure the distance from the case to the diagonal line, and we're going to square the distance. And the, the funny thing is, it turns out that distance can also be represented by y minus x squared, because the, the line is y equals x. So the, each distance is also y minus x. And that it took me a long time to get that one, but it, it's helpful. And then you can square that. So that's a simple way to get it. And in Python, the program is very simple. It, either d is 1 or 0. And if it's a 1, then we include that distance and square it. Um, squaring it, you have to be careful about signs. Um, but what Eliasson and Stryker said, and they actually suggested we name it after somebody called Sheldon, but I'm not really into all these male naming games, <laughs> so we're just going to call it an F test. Um, it's the ratio of the d sub distance by the distance we would have expected if we had had the data all in the upper triangle. So the, this is kind of the null hypothesis triangle, if you like, and this is the alternative hypothesis triangle. It's not the usual way that F is set up, but it's very good for this application. And in general, an F test is the ratio of two continuous variables whose estimate has been made from the data, so uh, usually the mean. And so we can have the mean of the variance, and you can use a variance uh, estimator there, and you can have the variance here for what would have existed if it was um, consistent with the sufficiency hypothesis, which would be zero. Can you see that if all the data was up there, distance would be zero. There would be none of these little error terms. Um, so we introduced the idea of measurement error so that there will be some little error terms. And it, it turns out statistically that, that comes out really nice. Um, much better than what's been happening with CSUF, with consistency. So they said, you, I mean, you could do a bootstrapping and have a credible interval around the consistency value and see if that includes 0.8, but you're still stuck with the subjectivity of choosing that cutoff level. With the F test, you're going to claim that the p-value is of an acceptable level of probability of being wrong in saying that the null hypothesis should be rejected. You know, that typical language of, of statistical inference so let me, let me push it further and try and explain it and show it to you. Um, basically looking at measurement error. I have argued that, and I don't think it's quite clear in Elias and Stryker's paper, the measurement error on, say, y shouldn't be really involved with the value of x. So if, we, if it's a function of x, say if it's getting greater with greater x, then that would lead to some problems with our estimation method. If it's random measure, measurement error, it's going to be OK. So a, a simple formula for f usually is the deviations divided by their degrees of freedom in the numerator, and then the deviations squared in the denominator, 
in this case, the minimum expected distance if the hypothesis is true. So there could be more error, but that doesn't really matter. We're going to try and get the f to be as high as possible using d stuff in the numerator and then this other formula for the denominator. So it's, it's a bit of a strange formula. But let me try and argue the case that the denominator should have not one distance, because many patterns would be consistent um, with the claim. For, for example, in the triangle, all the points could be up along the left-hand side near the top, and that would be just consistent, you know, and you would have the null hypothesis not rejected. Or they could be all spread out and close to the diagonal axis, and we're not going to discriminate between those two possibilities. So the numerator is going to measure only those which are below that diagonal, and the denominator is going to say, well, what if measurement error had made those fall below the diagonal? And, and in that case, points that are near the diagonal, but just below it, are going to have an influence, um, but maybe, maybe not as much as they had. So it's called, what, what they call this, the minimum distance under the null hypothesis, that would still be consistent with the idea that it's... Um, that x is sufficient for y. So I'm just going to show you that once in the diagram, if I may, sorry for flicking, it would mean that effectively your diagonal sort of shifts into some sort of curve or, or slope that's a little bit lower down, which is what Reagan had been showing from, from the year 2000 onward. That was what we wanted. And, and it turns out this is one way of doing it. Measurement error is innocuous as long as the mean of the measurement error is a zero. So we're going to make an assumption about the mean and the variance of the error. So say you set the variance at 0 0.15, and you set the mean as a parameter. It goes into our program now as a parameter. If it's positive, it means we're expecting a general undermeasurement of y. And in the article, they discuss the difference between the true value, which is unknown, and the observed value, which is known, and the difference is the error. If the error is negative on average, then that refers to expecting to see a general exaggeration of y, which is the one we really want to take, take care of, is if y has been exaggerated it's too high, and because of that, our you know, setting an arbitrary cutoff level is biasing the test in our favor. Um, so we're going to start, I think, with a mean of about minus 0.3 and a standard deviation of 0.15. And then you can do permutations around that to do sensitivity testing. Now, under very simple and straightforward statistical expressions, the sort of rules of expressions in, in, um, in the use of statistical inference, it's also the case that if we square those errors, and we take the expectation of the squared errors, then you get a really simple formula for that. It's a numerical formula. It comes out to a constant. So it's the mean squared plus the variance squared. And that's been very useful for me. It's gone sort of beyond what uh, Eliasson and Stryker did. And then the F statistic follows. It's a ratio of two random variables. And you see it in ANOVA. You see it in the F test for regression. So in our case, if F is large, then the p-value will be near zero, and we reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to reject if we have a lot of error, a lot of cases down below. Um, for the F statistic, um, the null, null hypothesis that X is sufficient for Y, and rejecting H0 means we have X is not sufficient for Y. Accepting H0 doesn't mean we've proved it, it means we just haven't falsified it. So I'm, I've written that out really carefully so that we can remember it later when we look at the results. So I'm nearly ready to turn to these results. For example, here, about six of the conjunctions, six of the permutations of six x variables seem to be sufficient for y. And they are, some of them are related. So I can sit with my pencil. I did that um, earlier. And I'll just tell you what, what those are, because you kind of have to retranslate it back. The things we've put in relate to theories in economics, and we've had no luck with regression on this data. Because the villages where the surveys were done are very isolated in back areas, all the people with a lot of education have left, and the women have very little education. So it doesn't follow the usual patterns of human capital model of economic work. But if I do just economic work and not just leave out domestic for a while, the main factors are education, household size, and uh, land and being a female-headed household. And then they overlap, so it's kind of all five of them, and then four of them, and three of them, and two of them. And essentially, if we go down to two, it's just land and being a female-headed household. So a female-headed household with land is working. So they're, all, they're all working. Female-headed household without land may not work, right? FHH in itself isn't sufficient. And that's the kind of interesting result we're hoping for. So we'll apply this to India now 
and make our comparison. So that's an interpretation of this big table. But I'll just go back to the slides to remind you how it's been done. The numerator is higher depending on the amount of error that you've got. The d stuff is the sum of the error squares of everything compared with that diagonal line. So they're all from below, right? And the, the denominator is a measure of the expected value of error in the model, which is just the little errors. That it would be a lot smaller and closer to the line, the amount of error that might have occurred at random from points near that line. And that error has to be independent of x and y. So here we've diverged from Huang. So Huang wrote a program in R where he did something very similar based on Stryker. I think he was in the team. But he's moved to China. We've not been in touch with Huang yet. And we found a kind of mistake in there, just sort of fixed error value, which isn't, it's not part of any of the documentation. So we're going to now start interpreting this and go to the illustration. So I've pasted my results into this spreadsheet. So when f is 0 0.02, it has a really small p-value. And then when f is, say, 3, 3, 6, 14, 5, 6, then it's p can, can you work out that the p-value would be higher then, meaning it's not a significant result? Yeah? I hope that makes sense. And we're able to you know, get, the, get it to give us those p-values. I hope I've said that right. Uh, just let me check. This is one with, no, oh, excuse me, I probably said it wrong. These are where the d-suffs are large. These distances are in the hundreds. The p-values are near 1 for nearly all of them. The f-values are large. So we reject, right? This is the funny thing. It's not the usual logic. So we reject the null hypothesis in all these cases. In this case, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. And so we have a p-value of point, sorry, we have a p-value here of 1. And I'm just going to go to the main results. <laughs> So D stuff is small, the C stuff is absolutely huge there, the F is tiny, and if F is tiny, then basically all the points are lying in that triangle. And what the software is giving us is a whole bunch of pictures as well to go along with this. So we now can look at the meaning in this, in this column over at the left. So I'll just read out some of those um, in terms of the X's. So X1 and 5 is that one, 1, 2 and 5. 1, 4, and 5 from the grid, 2, 4, and 5, 3, 4, and 5, and 1, 2, 3, and 5. And there is a column with the number of cases. Now, so far, the number of cases in these configurations where we've not rejected the null hypothesis, they're, they're rather small numbers. So it's not a kind of result that I'm really ready to publish because there's hundreds and hundreds of other women where it's not very clear that there's any pattern here. Um, but this is what we found with regression as well, with this data from Bangladesh. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dan. Um, is that the... Yeah, thanks. Where we would expect to see a clear either human capital model or maybe a simple peasant model, where if you have land, then you work in economic activities like livestock. Uh, didn't seem to match the data. But there's some pattern, and we, uh, it's worth looking at further. Uh, so I'm just going to conclude my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'd like to show you the graphs that we get, but what I did, I pasted an, a, a screen image of some of them in, so that you can just see how it would look. So you're getting, uh, for six, I think there's up to 64 different graphs. Some of them don't have any data, but most of them do. So these are showing crisp set points. Other ones will show where there's fuzzy set points all over the graph, and you can actually just glance through them all. So it's yes, 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 no. So this, this shows that x here is necessary for y and not sufficient. Other times you have the absence here. That one would show that x, x is necessary and sufficient for y in crisp set terms. And you get the same for fuzzy sets, so it's quite extensive and, and useful. Uh, so I'm, I don't really have any more time to explain that more, but I'd encourage people to try, and of course realize we have to invest some time in this. If to be a statistician, you've got to invest months and months of study time to get the building blocks. And I think realistically, you couldn't do this on one day of training. Uh, with QCA, you need a couple of days of training to, and that's, that's been a typical finding all over the country. And there's a shortage of people to do that training. So um, I'm ready to take questions. And I have a concluding uh, slide, just summarizing that, saying really, if you don't have a random sample, I wouldn't do this. If you have a random sample, you could. You could also use Raven's F-Test.
Uh, so I'll, I'll turn to questions now. Thank you, Mindy. Yeah. I think we can return this off now. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah.